Well, good morning. It's a real pleasure to be with you at Nairn Baptist Church. My name is Ian Jameson, and uh, it's been a few years since I've been with you at Nairn Baptist, so it's a joy to renew fellowship, even if virtually. It would be lovely to be together, wouldn't it? And I'm sure maybe that day won't be too far away. I hope that you're all keeping safe and well. I'd like to bring you greetings from my wife Rebecca and I, and also from all the believers at Ladybank Gospel Hall, where we attend here in Fife. I'd like to ask you to turn, please, today to Paul's epistle to the Colossians, please. Paul's epistle to the Colossians and chapter 1. To chapter 1, please. And we're going to read some very well-known verses from verse 15 to verse 20. And these are verses in which Christ, our wonderful Saviour, is in focus. He is the centre of our attention. And it'll be wonderful just to dip into these verses today. They really are. Uh, wonderfully rich and wonderfully deep so we'll just be dipping our toe in and in fact with God's help in two weeks time I'll be with you again and we'll be going back to these very same verses but focusing on a different aspect of them so let's read them together Colossians chapter 1 verses 15 to 20 he is the image of the invisible God the firstborn of all creation for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth visible and invisible whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross and God always blesses the reading of his precious word. Here in these verses, just five verses, we have a panorama of God's great project of redemption. His great plan is covered in just these five verses. Look with me at the last phrase of verse 15. Christ is introduced to us here as the firstborn of all creation of all creation. So our minds are being brought back to the very beginning of all time, the very beginning of all things, God's creation of this world. But then towards the end of these verses, we're thinking not so much about creation, but about reconciliation, the reconciliation of all things in and under Christ. So from the creation of all things to the reconciliation of all things, and what's at the centre of it all? What's at the very centre? It's at the end of verse 18, that in everything he, that is Christ, might be preeminent. Preeminent. There's a church I used to go and preach in on the west coast of Scotland, and above the um, lectern of the church there was an arch, and across that arch it had this that in all things he might be preeminent. And the he was right on the keystone of the arch. And I just thought that was so significant because Christ was central. And I'm sure that you and I would want that for our own churches too. That whether it's near Baptist Church or the Gospel Hall here in Ladybank, we want Christ to be our priority, Christ to be our preoccupation. That whatever else people around us might say about us, they would say, well, Jesus Christ is their first and foremost priority. I wonder if the Lord Jesus is my priority. I wonder if he has preeminence in the time I spend, in the energy that I have, in the things that I do and say and think, is Christ preeminent? It's a challenge to all of us, isn't it? Now, God willing, next week, uh, or week after next rather, when I'm with you again, we're going to focus on this phrase that's found twice in these verses, firstborn. Firstborn of all creation, in verse 15. Firstborn from the dead, in verse 18. And what does it mean for Christ to be the firstborn? And we're going to focus on that with the Lord's help in two weeks' time. But today I want us to focus in our minds on the first phrase of these verses. I want to think about Christ today as the image of the invisible God. The image of the invisible God. What does it mean for Christ to be the image of the invisible God? You know, images are very powerful, aren't they? And we live in a day and generation which is perhaps more than ever before. I think it's always been true of mankind ever since he's... Uh, ever since Eve saw that the fruit of the tree was pleasant to look at. Ever since then, until today, uh, sin uh, is the same. All throughout history, isn't it, really? The things that motivate us. 
We're driven by images, but perhaps today more than ever before, because of the access to almost permanent entertainment that we have. In our culture today, we are driven by images. Before Rebecca and I got married, I lived in London and worked in central London. And so I had to go in on the underground every morning and then back at night. And you would look along the length of the carriage to your right and to your left. And what would you see? Men and women with their faces glued to images, whether it be phones or iPads, tablets, newspapers, magazines, headphones in and images. Not talking to each other, not conversing, but just glued to images. And that's the culture in which we live. Images are powerful. They have the power to do many things, but I want just to focus in on two things that they have the power to do. They have the power to communicate powerfully and also to captivate the human heart, to captivate the human heart. I'd like us to go back into the Gospel of John, please, to John's Gospel, just to see a couple of examples of this in relation to our Saviour. John chapter 14 and verse 8, and Philip here asks, uh, makes an intriguing request really of the Lord. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. How does the Lord reply? Have I been with you so long, and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. We could read on, but we'll just stop for a moment there. What a statement to make. You know, I wonder if you're like me. Sometimes you read through the Old Testament whether it be the fall of the walls of Jericho, parting of the Red Sea, uh, the manna being distributed in the wilderness. And we just think, oh, I wish I could have been there. I wish I could have been there to see that happen, to, to be there when the Shekinah glory filled the tabernacle or when the, the glory of the Lord was so strong in the temple that it was like the train of his robe filling the place. And yet, and yet I'm sure that all of us as Bible believing Christians, as those who have come to know and love the Lord Jesus, if we were given the choice, we would say, no, 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 I want to be there. I want to be there in Nazareth, Capernaum, Bethsaida, Jerusalem. And I want to meet the real living saviour. I want to be like that woman who reached out and touched the hem of his garment. Or be like that woman who met him for a drink at the well. You know, it's incredible to think that to reach out and to touch Jesus was to reach out and touch God. That he is God. He is deity. To look upon the Lord Jesus was to look upon God himself. So he communicated God in perfection. God had, of course, been communicated through his prophets uh, uh, in many times and in many ways, as Hebrews chapter 1 tells us. But in these last days, he has finally and fully spoken to us in his Son. We wouldn't know God if it weren't for the Lord Jesus Christ. And then a little bit earlier in John's Gospel, please, if we could go back to John chapter 7. John chapter 7. And here the Lord is in the temple and he is preaching his famous message. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And we listen to the reaction, the reaction of the people. When they heard these words, this is verse 40, some of the people said, this really is the prophet. Others said, this is the Christ. But some said, is the Christ to come from Galilee? And then they have a discussion about the prophecies about the coming Messiah. But then we read about the officers who were sent to arrest him. Verse 45, the officers then came to the chief priests and Pharisees who said to them, why did you not bring him? And then listen to their answer. The officers answered, no one ever spoke like this man. No one ever spoke like this man. Something had captivated them. And priests and Pharisees and publicans and tax collectors and men and women and children all throughout the life of the Lord Jesus and his public ministry were captivated by him captivated by him I wonder this morning can I ask you a personal question are you this morning as you watch this video are you captivated by the Lord Jesus Christ there'll be a number of answers to that question there'll be those who might say well I don't know the Lord Jesus in a personal way and I haven't yet become a Christian. And if so, then all of us, both at Nairn Baptist and myself, would urge you to place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ today and to do so without delay. And anybody at Nairn Baptist would be willing to speak to you about that. But there might be others who are Christians today who would say, do you know, how long have you got 
He means everything to me. Jesus Christ is my saviour. He's my master. He's my closest friend. I can't imagine life without him. He has transformed my life. But there might too be Christians today who would say, well, if I'm really honest, Ian, if I'm really honest, sometimes it feels like I'm barely putting one foot in front of the other on the narrow road. Sometimes it's one step forward, three steps back, and my vision, my vision of the Lord is just cloudy at best sometimes. And I'm not sure I could say I was captivated by him. Maybe the world has come in. Maybe material things have come in. Just the busyness of life has come in and just clouded that clarity that once we had when we were captivated first by his love and by the message of the gospel. So friends, the Lord Jesus, when he came, he communicated God perfectly and he captivated people's hearts. But you know, isn't it remarkable today? It's 2021. It's 2021, 2021 years since the Lord Jesus Christ came to this earth. And men and women and boys and girls all over the world are still today becoming Christians for the very first time. They are still placing their faith and trust in Jesus and being captivated utterly by him. Lives completely transformed, never the same again. It's impossible, isn't it, to have an encounter with the risen Lord Jesus Christ and to remain the same. And there will be people today who will become Christians for the first time, who will have woken up this morning unsaved and will go to their beds tonight with a guaranteed relationship with the Lord Jesus, a place in heaven when they die and a completely new life. Isn't that remarkable? And yet we're told that he uh, is dead and gone. Well, that's not the case, is it? He is alive today. He's still saving people from sin. Well, I'd like us to do a little bit more thinking then about what it means for him to be the image of the invisible God. We've seen that he communicated and he captivated. But if I was to give you a piece of paper and a pencil and say to you, could you please draw me something invisible? I'd like to ask you to draw me something invisible. What would you draw? Well, of course, it's impossible because the very definition of something that's uh, invisible is that it cannot be represented in an image. The story goes, of course, of the primary school teacher who's doing her rounds and she comes across the little girl scribbling with crayon, something sort of nondescript as far as she can tell. And she asks the girl, what are you drawing? And she says, well, I'm drawing God. I'm drawing God. And she said, oh, that's very sweet, but nobody knows what God looks like. And she says, well, they will in a minute. Of course, that's one way of looking at it. But of course, if something is invisible, it means it can't be seen. It can't be seen. I'd like to take you back, please, to the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis and chapter 1, please. The book of Genesis and chapter 1. My friends at church make fun of me and they say sometimes, you know, Ian, it doesn't matter what you're preaching on. You'll read something from Genesis and something from the book of Revelation. But I don't make any apology for that because the Bible is one story. One beautiful story from beginning to end. And like a well-oiled machine with many cogs, every section of the Bible fits in just perfectly with every other section to communicate the truth of God from beginning to end. And the beginning of our Bibles and the end of our Bibles is vitally important. The beginning of the story and the end of the story. So back to Genesis chapter 1. And I want to draw your attention to verse 26 and 27. And here we get to really the nub of the issue of the value of human life. We as Bible-believing Christians, we place an infinite value on human life, that every child that is conceived is precious in the sight of God, eternally precious in the sight of God. Why do we believe that? Well, part of the reason comes from here. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Then God said, let us make man. Of course, there we have the Trinity, the very beginning of our Bibles. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. And then down to verse 27. So... God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now, of course, the opening chapters of our Bible are under great attack today in many different ways. And here, of course, we have another one of those, that male and female, he created them. God only created male and female. Uh, It was true then, and it's true today. Back to Colossians, please. Back to Colossians. Uh, But this time to chapter 3. Because we've established here that man made God in his own image, which means that we are eternally valuable. We are creative just as God 
is creative. We have minds just as God has his eternal mind. We have a will just as he has his divine will. And yet, of course, the fall of mankind happens after these verses where God is made. Uh, God decides to make man in his own image. The fall of mankind occurs, that tragic parting of the ways between the creator and his creatures. And yet we find that that image of God, although marred and spoiled, is not reversed, is not cancelled by the fall. Look with me to uh, Colossians 3 and verse 9. And Paul writes this, Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices. And then listen to verse 10, And have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. And so, brothers and sisters, if, if somebody who does not know the Lord Jesus was to come into Nairn Baptist Church and hear the gospel preached clearly and simply, and they were to grasp your hand after the service and say, you know, I need to be saved. I need to become a Christian. You would just be elated, of course, and you'd take them, I don't know, into a quiet corner and you would pray with them and you'd lead them to the Saviour. Uh, so they can put their trust simply in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if they were a tall, thin person, uh, when they went into that time of prayer, they'll be a tall, thin person when they come out. If, like me, they're neither tall nor thin, then they won't be tall or thin when they come out of that prayer time. Our bodies don't physically change when we become a Christian. And yet, from that very instant, there is a renewal process going on after the image of our Creator. So, yes, every child that is conceived is made in the image of God, and yet those who become Christians, that image begins to become renewed. So we find our first point is this. Back to creation. Back to creation. Man is made in the image of God. But then on from creation to the commandments, please. To the commandments. Exodus chapter 20. Don't worry, we're not going to look at Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus and so on. Uh, but Genesis and Exodus, I want us to look at. And Exodus chapter 20, please. And here to the commandments. Um, and we have the first commandment in verse 3, you shall have no other gods before me. But then a slightly distinct commandment in verse 4, you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God and so on and so forth. So friends, here we have a very clear prohibition. Mankind is made in the image of God. We've established that. But we are not to use images in the worship of God. That is clearly prohibited for the children of Israel. And I believe that commandment still stands today. But we are not to use images in the worship of God. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not talking here about children's illustrated Bibles or Sunday school stories. But I'm talking about the use of images in the worship of God in the worship of God. Why is it that when you go to your services at Nairn Baptist Church, there isn't some great statue of Jesus Christ at the front or some beautiful oil painting of God or of the Holy Spirit? It's for this very reason, that God is the creator of all things. He is the unseen creator of all things. He is the God of everything. And if we were to try and depict him in an image for worship, it would only ever detract glory away from our great God. This was one of the key distinguishing factors of the children of Israel. The Gentile nations would go and they would go to the temple. We can imagine them visiting the temple. And of course they could only get so far uh, as Gentiles. But imagine if they were to go all the way in. They would say, well, where is your God? We can't see him. We can't smell him. We can't touch him. Where is your God? We can't bow down before him. We can't lay offerings at his feet. Where is your God? And they would answer, well, you see, we believe in the one who created all things. We believe in the unseen creator of all things. So mankind is made in the image of God, but images are then prohibited in the worship of God. We remember, of course, that when God instituted the tabernacle and asked them to build the tabernacle according to the pattern that he showed them on the mountain, he then fulfilled his promise. And at the end of the book of Exodus, God's glory came down, just as he said it would, and dwelt in the tabernacle for the first time. God was dwelling with man since the Garden of Eden, with the unique nation of Israel, still chosen and precious to God today. But then we turn forward to the climax, to the climax, to John chapter 1. And now we're on ground that's even more exalted than God's glory dwelling in the tabernacle. We find here in John chapter 1 and verse 14, And the word became flesh 
and tabernacled amongst us or dwelt amongst us. And then here we have some words, I think, penned by a man captivated by Jesus Christ. And we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. So friends, the Lord then comes in the incarnation and makes God visible. Yes, he was communicated by the prophets, but now in his son, he's touchable. He's there. He's visible, making God visible. Well, I'd like to turn you now to the book of Revelation. Just as I said, something in Genesis, something in Revelation. And on to Revelation chapter 13. We've thought about creation and the commandments. We've thought about the climax. And now on to a future conflict. A future conflict that's coming on the face of the earth. Now, um, I won't focus on this because this isn't our study for today. But here we have events that will unfold in a period of time that the Bible describes as the tribulation. And uh, it's my conviction that the church of the Lord Jesus will be in heaven during this time, beholding the glory of the Lord Jesus. In John 14, uh, the Lord Jesus promised that he was going to prepare a place for us, that where he is, we may be also. And in 1 Thessalonians 4, we are told about that wonderful event when the trumpet will sound and we will go to be with the Lord. But on the face of the earth, dreadful events will unfold. And we read about some of them here. I won't go into detail because we don't have the time, but just listen to the language that's being used. Then I saw another beast, writes John, rising out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb and it spoke like a dragon. But then down to verse 15. And it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. You remember back in the book of Daniel when Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego simply would not bow before the image of Nebuchadnezzar. Well here in the future there will be others who will refuse to bow to the image of this beast in the book of Revelation. But look with me at verse 15 carefully. It was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast. Friends that's a complete inversion of what happened in Genesis. To remember that God made man in his image and gave him breath Give him life by his own divine breath. And yet all victory is guaranteed in the cross, isn't it? We're on the victory side. All these conflicts which will come in the future, the outcome is guaranteed because of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me finish by turning you to 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1. Again, famous verses. See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. Friends, there's coming a day when you and I will see the Lord Jesus Christ for the first time. He promised that he's coming soon to take us to be with himself, and he always keeps his promises. You and I may have sung about him, read about him, prayed to him, spoke of him to others, preached him, shared him with colleagues and neighbours. And yet we've never seen him. And one day our eyes are going to meet his eyes for the very first time. And what we're told here is that that experience will be so transformative that it will change us into his very likeness. Peter, James and John saw something of the glory of the Lord Jesus at his transfiguration and they were never the same again. Well, you and I, when we behold him in all of his glory, with no sin in us to spoil the picture, we will be forever changed. Friends, he is the image of the invisible God. He communicates God perfectly. He captivates our hearts. And we pray, don't we, that we might be more captivated by him. Satan wants to cloud our vision of him. And yet the word of God would draw us time and time again to our Saviour in all of his beauty and all of his glory. Amen.